Hello, everyone. Lunchtime learners, always good to see you. Um, and as always, well, I have actually more than a few announcements today, but I'm going to try to keep it short because I don't want to cut in time for our wonderful speaker. So I'm going to need that. Um, so we're back. I mean, the Conservancy office has been bustling. The trailheads officially opened today. So stop by and say hello to our ambassadors. There was the first S101, orientations and trainings are taking place. Educational walks, talks, hikes, and bike rides, way too many to mention. So um, check out Better Impact. And of course, look at where we're really needed um, right now, which is Expedition Days Live, which is gonna be November 1st through the 5th. I mean, I think over a thousand kids are gonna go through um, our exhibit. So they're needing lots of help, lots of different opportunities to volunteer. So uh, sign up on Better Impact. Our next Lunch and Learn is gonna be October 13th. It's Peter Breslin, who is a PhD. And he's gonna to talk to us about how old is that cat, that saguaro? Uh, inquiring minds want to know. It's a question we have often and there's been some scientific research now. So he's gonna help fill us in on that. So last week, we looked at my, a micro view of nature, tiny seeds that come to life. And actually Steve and I went to see the exhibit and it wasn't just beautiful photographs. It was lots of great information too. So uh, if you get a chance, stop by the Civic Cent Center Library. Um, I think you'd really enjoy it. This week, we're gonna look at, have a more micro view. So Catherine Denae, our speaker, travels the world with her husband and, and keeps a travel and photography blog that can be viewed at their website, sweetlightsphotos.com and the pictures are just beautiful. She's a member of the Photography Society of America on the board of the Phoenix Camera Club and serves as the digital media chair on the board of the Arizona Camera Club Council. Catherine's photos have been published in many prominent magazines, including National Geographic and the Smithsonian Magazine. In her role of the Phoenix, uh, as president of the Phoenix Camera Club, she has invited all of us to their October presentation on phone camera photography. So, you know, sometimes you look at a picture on your phone and it's gorgeous and you try to blow it up or, uh, you know, print it out and the quality just isn't there. Or you want to send it to Mountain Lion so they can use it in one of our publications. And it just doesn't translate the same way. So the speaker on October 15th, will uh, help us to, to do that in a better way. So watch the newsletter for details. Um, so now it is my privilege to welcome our speaker today. Uh, I know you're gonna enjoy her presentation and looking at lots of her beautiful photos. Um, Catherine Denae, welcome. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful introduction. One small correction, I'm not the president of Phoenix Camera Club. So, oh. um, but I, I'm on the board there and we okay. are presenting on, uh, uh, I've phone photography uh, next month, and I actually have a summary slide at the end for those who might want to. Oh, talk. great. Thank you so much. That's awesome. Uh, so just remind me to flip because that would be after the Q&A slide. Okay. That's awesome. With that, I am going to share my screen and see if we can get started. Let's share here. Whoops. That's not the uh, conservancy. <laughs> <laughs> that was Africa. <laughs> Well, thank you for having me here. It's a real pleasure and a privilege to uh, have your time this afternoon. Let me go through and just highlight a couple more things about myself. Uh, first, I'm retired and I live in North Scottsdale. I'm a passionate photographer and I shoot with the Nikon D850, which is a DLSR, DLS, DSLR. Well, stumbling over that. Um, I focus on landscapes. Uh, that's really my passion but I enjoy traveling, culture, street, architecture, and wildlife. Basically, if I'm traveling, I love having the camera in my hand. Uh, as, I, as Max mentioned, I love to travel the world and I keep a travel and photography blog with my husband. And I would encourage you to check it out afterwards. Um, almost every location we go, we do a short story and include a few photos. It's usually light and, and it's easy just to scan through the photos. Um, and I will jump through these because we've hit these already. I've lived in the area for about 15 years. 
And I love the McDowell Mountains. In fact, I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but I call them my mountains. Um, and that's what I tell everyone. So I couldn't do a presentation without doing a quick orientation here. Um, and I've got a map of the different areas. And what I've tried to do is just highlight on those red stars, some of the areas where I'll be showing uh, and sharing some photos. Most of the photos I'll be sharing with you today are taken in the Southwest. Um, and some of them, you know, aren't in our park area or the preserve area because I'm trying to illustrate certain points. So I ask you to forgive me for that. But when it is from one of the preserve areas or trails, I will highlight that. All right, so today I'm gonna to talk about general compositional elements. This is really designed for a beginner or intermediate photographer. And then I'm gonna take those compositional elements and look at fauna, flora, and landscapes, and just some things to think about for each of these genres. Then I'll briefly highlight some of the gear I use, and then I'll outline some resources, and I'll open it up for Q&A. All right, so let's start with composition and go to the dictionary, where else to go to. Um, it's really the way in which something is put together or arranged, the combination of parts or elements that make up something. So I'm going to be talking about different photographic elements as I go through the presentation. And then I have a photographer I follow, Rick Salmon, and he always talks about making a picture, not just taking a picture. And I know I'm guilty of this. I'm on vacation. I just do a quick snapshot and I don't always think about is that the best composition? Is that the best light? You know, I capture the memory, um, but I look at the difference between my vacation photos and the photos I take as part of my passion. The ones that I take with my D850, I really look at saying, is that th something I wanna print? Is that something I wanna hang on my wall? So that's kind of how I, I look at my photography. So some general compositional tips, these may be familiar to you if you've done some photography in the past. Um, there's a rule of thirds. There's many rules, but the rule of thirds, I think, is easy to remember and easy to apply. Um, we're going to talk about filling the frame and simplifying your subject. We're going to talk about the basic rule of checking your edges, and I'm sure you can imagine what that means. Talking about isolating your subject and your, you know, whether it's isolating your subject from other subjects in your um, composition and also isolating them from the background. All right, so we'll start with the rule of thirds, um, basically a tic-tac-toe board. And the human kind of eye looks at it and finds a composition more appealing if the main subject is in one of those corners. And I'll give you an example. Here's my husband and I a few years ago at the wave. And you can see right there, it kind of puts us in the corner. Another example, beautiful hummingbird. I captured this at the Desert Botanical Gardens into the spring. And again, he's in that the corner there. Just gives the eye something to rest on. All right, filling the frame. I walked out of my house one day. I saw this beautiful flower blooming. You can tell it's against the wall. It had bloomed overnight. That's not a bad photo. But how do we make it have more impact? Well, we fill the frame. We get in close. Don't be afraid to get in close and fill the frame with your subject. Here's another example. I took of the Desert Botanical Gardens. I loved how these plants were, were spinning around and the details and the color. And I just thought this was really cool. But I looked at the back of my screen and I said, you know, this isn't, doesn't, <laughs> it looks busy. So I zoomed in and I just went in and said, what's my main subject? My main subject is the plant and the colors. So that's what I chose to do. Checking the edges. Now this image is from a long time ago. Um, I think probably because I've deleted all my bad images since then. Um, but this was taken, my husband and I were on vacation in the Grand Teton. So we looked out the window and we saw this gorgeous elk in the distance, nice big rack. I pulled the car over, I think I was driving and he looked out the window and snapped the shot. Of course, he never really looked at what was in his frame. So you can see him taking the photo in the side view mirror. So it's just something that's common. Um, too often, we're so eager to get our photo that we don't really think about what's in the frame. And we can, in many times, crop or straighten later in post-processing, but it never hurts to just take a quick look and see what's there. Here's another one, background. I captured this beautiful butterfly. It's a beautiful flower. But if you notice, the background's a little bit busy. And I found just by stepping just a couple steps over, 
I was able to isolate that same butterfly on the flower. So I was able to simplify my subject and, and allow my composition to have more impact. Here's another example. You may recognize this toadstool area in Southern Utah. And I'd gotten up, climbed up and, and did the photograph of the toadstool, which was great. Um, but I looked in the back of my camera and I said, I can't really see it. Once again, just by moving a couple steps over, I could better isolate my subjects against the sky in the background and, and make it stand out. Another example, beautiful gambel quail. I love these guys. I think they're just so funny with that feather that hangs over their face. Um, it's you know, a nice composition. It's sharp, his eyes sharp, he's looking at me. But if I had just been able to put him against a different background, you can see how much more impact that has. So it's thinking about when you have the opportunity to shoot, what's behind you or what's behind your subject. All right, so let's dig into some more details. Some particulars. When's the best time to capture um, fauna, whether it be birds or reptiles or uh, little critters that run around? They're most active early in the morning and late in the day, um, which is good if you like enjoy early morning hikes or you know late afternoon hike, or if you're walking around your yard early morning or the neighborhood. Um, it's a, a good time to be out and, and see them. Some tools that we might use. Um, I use a long lens. Um, and I use something called uh, VR, which is vibration reduction. Depending on the camera you have, um, it may offer you something and which brand it is. It may be a stabilization, it may be on the camera, and it may be on the lens. Um, it just find it helps you get a sharp shot even when you are, are not so steady. So my 80 to 400 is a little bit larger lens. Sometimes after I hold it a while, I'm not as steady as I should be. So that... Um, Vibration reduction helps me get a sharp shot. Wide open, so uh, focal length of, with an aperture of like 2.8 to 5.6 is usually good. It gets the, the subject in focus, but it can give you a nice soft blur in the background. And really, we just want our subject in focus most of the time. We want to vary the shutter speed depending on what we're capturing and, and how much movement. Birds in flight, like a large bird, like a sandhill crane that may come through or a goose or a blue heron that we might see, you know, might be one twelve fiftieth of a, a second. Whereas if we want to try to freeze a, a hummingbird, and we may need to go up to like one three thousandth of a second. Now, if you're filming or photographing reptiles, they move a little slow, slower most of the time, especially like a tortoise. So you can usually go a lot less, like one two hundredth of a second. And I'll give you some examples of these two. Some key compositional elements when we're looking at fauna, most important is the eyes. We really want those eyes to be sharp. We connect with an animal and we connect with our subject through their eyes. If you can get a little bit of catch light, that little bright white dot in there, that's even better. And if you're able to get the, the animal looking at you or the bird, Looking at you, it's, that's the icing on the cake. Uh, what we also want to do is try to capture a story or, or at least some behavior. So is there something about their environment that helps tell a story? Is it something about their interaction with another animal or critter that might tell a story? So something else to think about. You want to, if the animal is moving, to give it room to move. So you don't wanna have it up against uh, the edge of the frame because it looks like it's gonna hit a wall. And I'll show you an example of that. And again, background, and that's gonna be a theme you'll see throughout a lot of these examples. And then again, isolating, isolating your subject from between other subjects and also from the background. So here's a photo I captured this spring. Uh, you can tell uh, there's, where they are. So there's a little bit of environmental context. They're in the nest. They're not full grown yet. Um, you can tell there's three of them. There's enough separation there. And I was lucky enough, had a lot of patience uh, and got them all almost looking at me. Um, there's a lot of movement with animals. So a lot of times you want to grab one shot and then hope for the better shot. Um, but I was fortunate here. I've got all their eyes. They've got catch lights in their eyes. They're sharp and they're looking at me. So I was fortunate. This, I think, was one of the parents on a nearby uh, suero. And uh, I think he was sitting a little close to somebody else's nest. But I like how um, the feathers on his 
ears are like turned. And there was a little bit of wind that, that morning. And he turned to look at this other bird and it gives a, him a, a really interesting expression. So with this, I was able to cap, capture um, some behavior, an interaction between another bird, um, I'm fortunate to have a clean background, and then there's separation and that helps tell the story. We're back at the nest. Um, and again, here's one that says, okay, I'm ready to leave the nest. I'm stretching my wings. And I was fortunate again to capture him as he's stretching and he's looking right at me. So we have the eyes sharp, we have the catch lights, and we have the environment as well. Here's another little critter. Uh, I love this one. It's like he's just reaching for those last petals. He's eaten all the other petals and all the other flowers, and he's just out of reach to get that last one. So his behavior helps tell a story. Once again, the eyes are sharp, and there's a nice catch light there. This is one example where maybe the catch lights or the eyes are not as important because I'm capturing behavior behind this nuzzling. I think it may have even been the mother feeding an older um, a bird there. Uh, background again, here's one I captured at the Desert Botanical Gardens. And you can notice from the speed here, I've tried to give you some contextual information for each photo. That's one sixteen hundredth. And I'm surprised that his wings are as sharp as they are. Uh, but I captured him. He looks good. The flower looks good. But if I had just waited a little bit, which I did, I was able to get him on a better background. So it's a lot crisper image. Uh, another background, a uh, nice soft background here. His eyes are sharp. There's a little glint in his eye. And what I thought was fun was I captured that tongue. Um, and I was surprised that that was at one one sixtieth of a second. So I'd sat there for a while watching them and waiting to get that tongue because I thought that helped uh, tell the story. And at, it was a very sh slow shutter speed and it was still able to capture his tongue. Another example, nice sharp eye, beautiful background. Um, and he's looking, well, I can pretend he's looking at me. Here's another one shot by down by Canyon Lake. Um, and what I like about it is the swirl helps, helps give it context. We know it's down in, near us here in the Sonoran Desert. And I like how we've got the male and his mate. The light was soft, it was actually in shade. Um, so it gave a nice, uh, pleasant look to it. All right, I know we don't have these many flamingos here and I know we don't have this much water. Um, this was actually shot in Africa last month. And I love flamingos. I love the reflections. And it was just a beautiful light in the morning. And uh, what I suggest is if you see something, you know, take an image as quick as you can. Take your photograph and then work on the composition and, or then work on, you know, how can I make it better? Um, so you at least have something. Uh, there's too many times I spend... Uh, fiddling with my settings and I'll miss, miss my opportunity. My husband's a little quicker on the trigger and he's able to a lot of times get photos that I miss. But so here we are, the flamingos are walking by, they're beautiful. And I took my shot and then I waited and I waited to, I could compose something a little bit better. So here we still have really good context. You can see the rest of the birds in the background and I've been able to isolate this fellow and his reflection. Um, in the image. And if you can see, he's not, he's in the middle. So he has plenty of room to move to the right. You don't feel like he's walking up against a wall. So a quick right recap on our fauna. Most important, we want to look for those eyes sharp. And if we can get the catch lights, those are great. If we can get them looking at us, that's even better. We want to try to tell a story um, through their environment or through their interactions. We wanna make sure their background is simple or simplified or doesn't take away from our subject. Give them room to move if they're moving and then try to separate them from their background and from any others that may be in the frame. All right, let's talk about some flora. I love poppies, so you'll see a few examples from the poppies. Some particulars, when's the best time? Well, for most flowers, daytime is best, unless we're photographing a night blooming cactus. But this, uh, this photo here was actually taken early in the morning. I think I might've been out at the um, 
Granite Mountain area, or maybe even up at Bartlett Lake. And I got out early. I want the nice, beautiful light in the morning. And the poppies aren't open first thing in the morning. They wait till the sun hits them. So <laughs> I didn't quite have the image I wanted at that point. The other thing to think about is if we have an overcast day, which I know doesn't happen very often here in Arizona, but if you have that opportunity like in the spring and have an overcast day, it's almost like a soft box that it, the light is a lot softer. You don't get the harsh shadows. You don't have reflections or glare on petals um, and the color is a lot richer. So if you have the opportunity to have a cloudy day in the spring, um, take, take advantage of it. So some of the tools you might use is a slower shutter speed. Um, it's not moving very fast. It's not flying. Unless it's windy, that presents its own challenges. Um, I use both a macro lens, which enables me to get up close and get those details, or a telephoto. Um, and I, the telephoto I use is an 80 to 400. And I find that works really well, especially if um, I don't want to go off trail, which we need want to stay with our trails. The, the park system. Um, also, if I'm at the like the botanical gardens and staying on their trails, it allows you to get really close without having to walk up to your subject. Uh, and a lot of times you get some really nice images. A polarizer. A polarizer can cut the glare uh, if it's a sunny day and can also make your clouds uh, richer and your sky bluer. So if you're looking at a field of flowers in the spring when we're capturing our wildflowers, Polarizer is really good. A plant, and if you've done uh, photography with uh, flowers or plants, you may be familiar with it. It's a small clamp that helps hold your subject in place. And I'll show you an example. A reflector. Um, I use a reflector a lot of times just to add a little more light to my subject, especially if I have a flower that has a deep center. And the reflector allows me to bounce light from the sun into the flower and light that up so it's more even lighting. I use a tripod most of the time, um, especially because uh, sometimes with a flower, if it's a really deep type of flower, I will take multiple shots, multiple, multiple focal lengths in order to get make sure that that flower is sharp all the way through my image. And then I will take those multiple images and combine them later in what's called focus stacking. So the software I use for focus stacking is Adobe Photoshop. Some key compositional elements. We don't have to worry about eyes here. So we want to look at the light and I'll show you some tricks on how to use the light. Again, the background, <clears throat> you can see this image here. It's a very soft background. Odd numbers, uh, the human brain finds odd numbers more appealing. So if you have an opportunity, think about composing your image with an odd set of uh, flowers or plants or leaves. It, it's uh, a better composition in most cases. Separation, you want to make sure you can see your subject. And you always want something sharp. Sometimes with the um, macro lens, it gives you a nice soft blur around the edges. But as long as you have something sharp for the eye to rest on, that's most important. All right, here's some of the tools that I was just talking about. And I borrowed these photos from the we had to add a ramo website. They were just nice, clean images. Um, the clamp is on the left. You can see it has uh, two ends with clamps on it, and you can see how it might be used in the center image. And then it also shows the use of another one with holding on to the reflector um, and then a polarizer. I use a circular polarizer, and I can adjust how much polarization is happening with my image. A tripod, and this is just an example. Uh, the software, Lightroom, and Photoshop are the two tools I use the most. Uh, and then here's a series of reflectors. And the first one really helps just cut the sunlight. It looks just like a hazy uh, this, And that's really good on a really sunny day just to cut the light onto your subject. And then I talked about reflecting light into the center of my flowers. And I'll use either uh, like a silver reflector here or a gold reflector. And they also make one that's silver and gold, and that's one I use also. And if I'm out in the field, I have a 12 inch diameter. And if I'm around the house or close to my car, I will use like a 30 inch diameter. All right, so let's think about how we might use light uh, to highlight our subject. 
And here's one I was shooting up at a saguaro. I wanted to capture that flower. And by using the shadow of that one branch, I was able to make my subject pop. Now, I, I actually had cropped this in a little bit more so that you didn't see the light around uh, that shadow, but I wanted to make sure it was clear what I was doing. So I left that in in this image. Here's another example. This is a night blooming flower. Um, this is actually in a large planter on my patio and it's not in a studio and I did not use a backdrop. I waited till the sun had moved. So the light was on the flower, but not on the covered patio. And what it did with that shadow was enough to create that dark background. And then what I did was I took a reflector and I bounced that light in. So it was light all the way into that flower. Here's another one. Once again, it's a planter on my patio and it bloomed at night. I went out first thing in the morning. I waited for that sunlight. So it was just on the flower, but not on the patio. And I was able to get this image. And again, I used my reflector to bounce the light inside. We talked about odd numbers in the introduction here. Um, here's just an example. We've got two versus three. So it, just gives you an opportunity to kind of look and say, okay, is the three more appealing for, for yourself? Here's another one, three different elements. Um, again, nice soft background, and I've separated my subject. I want to illustrate those beautiful lupines. Poppies, I think are one of my favorites. Uh, this is another example. Early in the morning, they hadn't opened up yet, um, but I took advantage of it, and I just wanted to capture the detail as it started to open. And again, there's five there, nice odd number, nice soft background, and there's something sharp for my audience. Uh, <clears throat> I talked about separation. Here's some more poppies, beautiful field of poppies. But just by stepping aside or evaluating my um, scenario, I can separate my subject and help it stand out just a little bit better. Uh, again, some elements here. I think I photographed this. There's a spring flowers um, in the Granite Mountain or up by Bartlett Lake. Uh, I have three flowers and five buds. I think that was accidental, but I like how it works. Um, again, nice soft background. It may have even been dirt, um, but it looks nice in the image contrasted with the, the purple. Um, and again, there's something sharp in, in that foreground flower there, a little bit of the dew and a little bit of the, the petal. Another image here, the poppy starting to open, beautiful grass surrounding it, provide a nice soft background. And I just want to make sure the inside was sharp. So as you look down into it, you can see that nice softness. And I really liked how the outside of it was looking like a pinwheel. This again was photographed on my patio and I just went in close and tight. I want to focus on the colors and the contrast. So a quick recap on our flora, um, the light. And I would really encourage you to take advantage of shadows when they are there, if it can help highlight your subject. Really think about your background, either make sure it's neutral or try to um, use a focal length that'll help blur it. Uh, think about odd numbers, separate your subject from the background and from other subjects and make sure you have something sharp. All right, here's my, my passion, landscapes. All right, some particulars with our landscapes. When's the best time to photograph them? Well, it's the golden hour. That's the hour or, or time period just before and just after sunrise and just before and just after sunset. Now, the challenge we have uh, with our preserve is it doesn't open till sunset, sunrise and then closes at sunset. So it's a little more challenging to get the best light. Um, if you're actually walking one of the trails. But it's uh, very possible to capture photos um, during the day. So we'll look at that as well. For example, the one I shot on the right was during the spring. You know, we had just had beautiful brittle bush blooming. And this was up by Bartlett Lake. And I was fortunate to have a beautiful sky that day too. So during the day can work, but the golden hour um, just gives you a richer color. We'll, we'll take a look at some examples. Some tools, uh, lower shutter speed, lower ISO, 
um, larger depth of field, like you can see on the one on the right, actually went to F16. And that was to make sure that the flowers in the very foreground were sharp and it was sharp all the way through to the suero in the background. Also, if you want to create that beautiful starburst that you see in some images, if you want to <clears throat> set an aperture of usually at least F18, I use F22 if I can to create those starbursts. A tripod, a wide angle to long lens. So I will use just about any kind of lens depending on the scene. And if I'm using my longer lens, I turn off my vibration reduction or stabilization um, on the tripod. There's a lot of data that shows that if you've got that turned on and you've got it on a nice steady surface, the camera seems to not know what to do and that can make your images a little bit soft. Key compositional elements, uh, the light, we'll, we'll look at that. Clouds and weather. I know we don't have clouds often here unless it's monsoon season, but the clouds can really add an interesting element to your photograph. Uh, a level horizon, and this seems obvious, and I'm sure you've seen on Facebook or wherever you look, your, your friends or family taking photographs of their beach vacations, and you look at the horizon and it's slanted, and you wonder if we're going to lose all the water out of the ocean. But I'll give you another example, and just um, of something I shot and something I hadn't realized because I always figure, okay, you can fix it in post. You just adjust your horizon. It's easy enough. But I'll show you an example where it doesn't always work. Foreground elements help draw your viewer into your image. And then the, you can create leading lines either through the light or through your subject to help draw your viewer in. Again, if you can, depending on what you're photographing, you want to look at separation. Here's an image I shot. This was up on. Um, Tom's thumb. Uh, this, was, I believe, was on the landslide trail. I was out looking for spring flowers with my girlfriend. I turned around and it was just beautiful. You know, I was fortunate we had beautiful clouds. Um, it was midday, but it still made a nice image. And what I tried to do here was I tried to separate all the key elements. So all the sueros have a little breathing room and that nice rock there with the, the hole in it also is separate from the sueros. And so I tried to create that image where there was a lot of space between my key elements. And then you can also tell my main subject was there. If you think about the rule of thirds we started with, it's on the right third of the, the image. Another image taken at Granite Mountain, um, beautiful Suero as my the prime subject in the mountain in the background. And then the path helps draw the viewer in. So that can act as your leading line. And I was also fortunate enough to have a few clouds that day, but just to emphasize uh, the leading line into the image. Golden hour, now you can see how the suero all of a sudden looks a different color. And that's that nice soft golden light that we see at golden hour. Here's Superstition Mountains, the clouds had moved through. We had a bad storm. My husband went and I went down there to photograph it. It was in the spring. The brittle bush was blooming. It was amazing. Um, so we had a lot of interesting elements for this photograph. What I also looked at was how do I let those flowers help draw me in? It's a nice foreground element. You can see the details and then it draws you in all the way up to the mountain. And just so you can see on the edges, I don't know if you see the ridge line. The ridge line is nicely framed to draw the viewer in, and then the flowers in the foreground also help draw the viewer into the main subject. Uh, here's an image I think I photographed at the Gateway Loop Trail. It was golden hours, late in the day. I was almost at the end of my hike, um, and I just thought the light was beautiful, and I liked how it had backlit the cacti, and I also thought it was nice because it kind of drew you into the main subject of the suero. Let's see how that works. Oops, jumped too far. Uh, another image, this was shot at sunrise. It wasn't in the park, but sometimes you can get creative. Uh, this was also off of Pima Road. Um, I was driving up and looking for the sunrise and pulled over. And I think that's part of the park there now, part of what's been added. And it's looking east, of course, towards Granite Mountain. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to add enough separation between the cacti. This is one captured at the Lost Dog Trail. Again, you can see the golden light, um, nice foreground elements of variety of cacti, the choya in the midground, 
and then the, the McDowell Mountains in the background. And I used a, a large, a, a very small aperture, F16, so that I could have it in focus from the very beginning all the way through the end. Here's one I captured, I believe this was at Granite Mountain. It had been cloudy. My husband and I hoped that we could get out for a good sunset. And we are lucky the sun broke through at the right time. And this is not, the color is not added. I think you all know, you've seen some amazing colors here in the desert. And this was one of those evenings where the sky just lit up just before sunset. And I was able to capture the ridge. And I really tried to focus in on the swirls. Now, the, the ridge in is, isn't as clean as one might like, but you, at least you can see the swirls and the nice silhouette and the amazing sky. All right, so sometimes we don't really have a choice of shooting when we'd like to, to photograph. And my husband and I had the opportunity to go up to Rainbow Arch a number of years ago. And you go out when the boat takes you. And it was midday. It was like the worst time of day to do any photography. And you can see it's just kind of all washed out. The light's poor. But we got off the boat and we started walking towards the arch. And we found by just walking through the arch to the other side and turning around, we got this photo. And that's still the middle of the day. It's still harsh light, but the colors are so much richer. So many times if you're out and you happen to not have the opportunity to go back at, at a better time, think about where the sun is, put it to your back, and you'll notice that the colors are a lot richer when the sun is shining on them. Another sunset shoot gone awry. Uh, we were there to photograph sunset and a storm moved through. And we just waited and the light broke through just for a few seconds and lit up those rain clouds and made an amazing photograph. So I would encourage you when it looks interesting skies or stormy, sometimes you can get your best photos. Another one, this is Four Peaks, which you can't see because it's still snowing up there. Um, it had snowed and I wanted to capture the snow on the mountains and I wanted to capture it on the Sueros. And we headed up on the Beeline Highway, and this is as far as we got. The road was closed due to the snow, but I wanted to at least capture the swirls with the contrast of the snow in the background. This is the image I talked to you a little bit about, um, a level horizon. We always want to try to do a level horizon. A lot of times when I'm on a tripod, I make, double check it and I make sure it works, but I wanted to get that starburst. And I wanted to get it before it disappeared over the edge. This is um, a lone pine. You may recognize it from White Pocket up in um, southern, uh, northern Arizona. You can see I used the F22, the, the small aperture, to get that, that nice burst on the sun. And I went down low, and I don't even know if I used my tripod. I just wanted to capture that image. And I said, you know, I'll fix it in the post. And I fired off my images before the sun disappeared. And when I went, got back later and I tried to look at the image, I realized if I adjusted my horizon, I was going to lose my tree <laughs> and I was going to lose my clouds. Um, and I had that beautiful puddle with that nice reflection. And so I salvaged the image by going vertical, but it's really not the image I'd hoped to capture. So it's just something else to think about. If you can get your horizons level, um, a lot of times you can correct and post, but sometimes you can't. So a quick recap on our compositional guidelines. For flora, we talked about light. Um, we talked about the shadows and having your subject lit um, with the background and shadow. We talked about simplifying the background, filling the frame, simplify the scene as much as possible. Odd numbers can be very interesting and making sure your, your subject's separate from the background and from other elements you may be photographing. For a fauna, you want to think again about the background. It can be distracting. Make sure the eyes are sharp. Um, if you can capture behavior to help tell your story or something about their environment can really add to your photo. For landscapes, you want to look at the golden hour if you can. You want to look at leading lines or a foreground element that helps draw your viewer into your image. Bad weather can be very good. Um, if you can't choose your time, look for the sun and see if you can work with it. And then the lessons of the level horizon. Some general tips. I would always recommend you take two photographs um, or more. 
most of us are working with digital. It's easy enough to do. Chip space is cheap. Um, take multiple images. Take a moment to review what you've captured. And I always say, you know, get your image and then look at what you have. I can't tell you how many times I've set up for photographing one subject and then I turn and photograph something else. My settings are all wrong and I don't realize it till later until I look down and go, oh my gosh, why is this so dark? Or why is it blurry? Um, you know, take a moment, review your shot. And then, you know, if you need to make your adjustments, feet can be your telephoto. So if you don't have a long lens, can you walk a little closer? Can you rethink your image? Look for your story, even on landscapes, you can look for a story. It might be the light, it might be a path, it might be the flowers. Try to simplify your image, make sure your subject is clear. Um, know your camera. Uh, somebody told me this very early on, but if you know your camera and you can make adjustments very quickly, you might be able to capture that coyote that's running by or that bird that's sitting in the saguaro. Um, you can quickly make your adjustments with it. Otherwise, you may spend so much time fumbling with your camera that you miss your shot. And then at the end of the day, be patient. A lot of times, especially with wildlife, um, you need to wait uh, and on the hope for the right behavior, hope for the right interaction, or wait for them to arrive. So what's in my camera bag? Um, in general, I always have my bag. I have um, two cameras, two camera bodies. I'm fortunate enough to be able to have two, They're both the Nikon D850. And this gives me the flexibility that I can put two different lenses on. So I have one lens on one body and one lens on another. Uh, it gives me an opportunity to go to, and shoot like a landscape or zoom in close for something tight like a flower or a bird. Um, depending on where I am and what I'm doing, it gives me a lot of flexibility. It's also good in the desert where we have a tremendous amount of dust and sand. If I'm changing lenses out, I get a lot more dust on my sensor. Um, so this is another reason that I use two bodies. I always have extra batteries in the chip. Um, when I'm shooting locally, I really never needed it, but I always have it. I always have lens cloths and cleaners. We, have, we live in a dusty environment. <laughs> and especially when I'm out, around here in the, in the mountains here or, or taking a hike. Uh, I have first aid kit and it includes my pliers and comb. And as careful as I've been and my husband and I have been, we always seem to encounter a choya or we run into somebody who has. And so those come in really handy. For fauna, so the general gear is what I always have in my backpack. And then I swap out my lenses depending on what I'm shooting. So when I'm shooting um, wildlife or fauna, uh, my 80 to 400 is my go-to lens, um, and it's just big enough to get long and get into my subject, but it's also lightweight enough that I can handle it, handhold it. Um, I have a longer lens, but I can't carry that with me. I can only use it with a tripod. So my 80 to 400 is really my go-to lens. If I'm shooting the flora, um, I love my macro lens, um, and it's great for the flowers. And then the second lens would be my long lens, the 80 to 400. I almost always have a tripod, almost always have my reflectors, and I usually have a, a polarizer. And that helps cut the glare and enrich the colors. For landscapes, my go-to lens is a 24 to 70. Um, it just gives a nice view of the scene, and that's usually what I'm capturing the sky and the scenery. Always have my tripod. Um, I always have a polarizer. And if I'm shooting any type of water or I want to try to create movement in the clouds, I will use what's called a neutral density filter. And I usually have at least a three stop and a six stop. All right, uh, some resources. I would encourage you to go to my website, which is sweetlightphotos.com. I have a whole page of resources and the uh, training that I mentioned earlier for the few people that were on, it is there and there's links to it. I've got uh, suggested books, some other photography blogs that are good to follow, um, apps that are good. Um, and, just, and I've also built uh, tips for certain areas for photography. And I think there's also a link to areas to photograph in our area. Uh, some things, if you wanna get more involved in photography, uh, I, I can't recommend the Phoenix Camera Club highly enough. It's great uh, group of people. We have monthly outings. We have monthly uh, competitions, um, 
and speakers. So it's always uh, a rich resource. The Photography Society of America um, is wonderful. They also have an annual conference, um, a lot of training. I'm involved in a, a training class now, and it's super. It's helping me bring my photography to the next level. Uh, Kelby One Training provides everything, every type of training, not only uh, wildlife and nature, um, but wedding photography, uh, black and white, almost. And then they will also go through the tools. Uh, whether it be Lightroom or Photoshop, it's a rich resource. Some of the weather apps that I use when I'm photographing sunrises and sunsets, um, Sunset uh, WX, It's to me it's kind of entertaining because they try to predict how good the sunrise or sunset will be. Um, they're accurate at least 50% of the time, um, but it's kind of fun to check that before I go out. I usually use windy.com and darksky.net. It allows me to look at winds, different levels of clouds, because the different levels of clouds will um, reflect different amount of light. So you can tell if it's a good or bad sunset. Um, tools, PhotoPills is like the planning tool for landscape planning, it allows you to know when and where the sunrise is happening, the sunset, you can pick any location in the world and put a pin in and determine where the sun or rise or sunset is gonna happen relative to that position. You can also look at moonrise and moonsets, uh, Milky Way rise and sets, meteor showers. Um, it's got just about everything. And they do a great job with training as well. And then Lightroom and Photoshop I use for post-processing. So finally, I would say, is there any questions? And I will move briefly to this page. I did do a page on cell phone photography. I think a lot of the compositional uh, things I was talking about today, you can use and apply with a cell phone. But if you wanna learn a little bit more about how to share those images, how to potentially print those images, Adriana Greisman is doing a presentation as part of our camera club, October 15th at 6.30. Guests are always welcome at our camera club. Um, the parking there at the Grace Lutheran Church is a little bit challenging. We have parking in the Northwest lot and ask for a parking pass so that you don't have to pay a parking fee. Uh, and this will, information will also be on the Phoenix Camera Club site after uh, our next meeting. So I put September information up first. The October information will happen at the end of the month. So questions? That's great. Thank you so much, Catherine. This was wonderful. The images were not only beautiful, but I love your summaries at the end. You know, I'm a I'm a bullet point girl, you know, so <laughs> and I really appreciate it. It was all wonderful. And we have several questions. Just to mm -hmm. let everybody know, too, the information that you just posted about uh, camera phones will also be in our newsletter. So keep an eye out. Uh, you know, probably beginning in October. So you'll have the information in print. Um, and my husband, Steve's gonna help me by asking some of the questions here, because there's quite a few. Yes. So earlier, Bob Harwood asked about Photoshop and where you can, and do you, the, uh, Fred asked, uh, do you ever use Photoshop? Yes, I do. Oh, okay. I use it in particular. Um, I find I go to Photoshop when I need to remove something from an image, like I, I didn't check my edges and there's a large tree branch there. Um, I also use it if I'm using photos, focus stacking. So if I've shot different depths and I do that sometimes with landscape um, to make sure it's sharp all the way through my image and also with flowers um, when I'm shooting flowers. So I'll do it for focus stacking and I use it for removing some um, images. But most of my uh, image editing, I do in Lightroom. Mm. Thank you. Um, RSG had some questions about equipment and it's a, she wants to know uh, what type of pack or carrier do you use to hold your camera and lenses while hiking? Also, uh, what brands of lightweight tripods uh, do you recommend? And uh, the, the low pro packs are nice, but there's not much room for other hiking essentials. Do you have a recommendation? <laughs> All right, so there's something about bags and tripods. Um, my bag, I have a low pro bag um, and it's great for my gear, but the challenge is, a couple challenges, is it's not, I can't put other gear there. For So for hiking, um, 
it's not as good. I have enough room for a water bottle um, and my tripod and I can squeeze a snack in. If I put a sandwich in, it gets a little bit more of a pancake. Um, so if, if I'm a short hike, I will work with that. If I do a longer hike, I will limit it to one lens usually. So let's say when I was hiking out to the wave, I limited it to like my 24 to 70. I had a backpack and you can buy inserts for a backpack and it's enough to provide padding around my camera. So I have a small insert. I'll drop my camera in there with, you know, like the batteries and chip and a lens cloth and I'll just make a mini pack. Um, and then I'll put it in my backpack so I can fit, you know, my, my jacket, my lunch, my water and all that. So yeah, that's yeah. not a clear answer, but that's how I work it. No, that's good to know. Um, we have a question from Art. It says, uh, does, uh, do you find that the growing power of post-production minimizing the need for a tripod um, and use higher ISO and sharpening overcome the need for a tripod? That's a great question. Um, yes. Um, I'm finding, especially a lot of the newer mirrorless do a great job um, with noise. So you can shoot at much higher ISO um, and you can do that in post-processing. Um, and I'm taking advantage of, if I have the opportunity, if I do landscapes, I always have my tripod. Uh, just, it, it helps me think about my composition, helps me to make sure I'm level. Um, and I, I like to get that depth of field all the way through. Um, and a lot of times it's a very slow shutter speed and I would rather get a clean image in camera as, as possible. Um, I do use Topaz Denoise and Topaz Sharpen and they are amazing for um, cleaning up noise post image. I mean, I just give you an example. We did a gorilla trek in Uganda last month. We were shooting the gorillas deep in the forest. Um, there was no way to do a tripod. It's wildlife. Uh, we're just shooting on the fly. And I, a lot of my images are 25,000. And um, I run them through Topaz Denoise. And they're pretty good. Um, it's not perfect. Um, sometimes it works better than other times. I've shot birds uh, at a higher ISO. And they come out beautiful. And they're clean. Um, but I would just lean towards getting as much in camera whenever possible and get it with a tripod. And I think in your last question, somebody was asking about tripods, lightweight tripods yes. and heavyweight tripods. For me, um, I have a really right stuff, uh, heavy duty tripod. And that is my anchor. I love that tripod. Um, and I, for travel, I have a small lightweight travel Gitsu. Uh, both are carbon fiber, um, pretty lightweight. Um, I would encourage you always invest in a good tripod. We started off with the little ones from Best Buy, you know, 15 years ago, and they don't hold up very well and they don't really do your, they do you a disservice. They really don't hold your camera steady. Um, then we upgraded to, you know, the next version and those worked a little better. But um, if you're serious about your photography, get a good tripod, invest in it. Well, there was a lot of information today, a lot of technical things that a lot of people uh, amateurs and unskilled photographers don't know, but uh, with all the things we talked about, I, I, Kathy wants to know, are there three top things for an unskilled professional to take away from today's lecture? She's always getting her fingers in front of the lenses, so she's one of the <laughs> <laughs> Three things. Um... Yeah, there's a lot of good stuff there today, so I'm sure it'd be difficult, but um, of course, these are always, this is uh, recorded and we can all go back and look at it on Stuart World. I would say don't get hung up with rules. You know, I have to really think about what your subject is and how are you capturing your subject? You know, what's your intention when you're capturing the image? And then your light and your angle and everything else will follow. And it doesn't matter as much what kind of gear you have. It's, you know, what are you trying to capture? And what are you trying to share with someone? And can the light, carry that through? Um, can your angle carry it through? Uh, but I would, that, that would be the top thing. Um, I would say know your camera, know what it can and can't do. Um, you know, I've been out shooting stars and having, and knowing my camera allows me to make adjustments to those settings without having to turn a flashlight on and blind everybody and try to figure it out. Um, so know your camera, um, have fun. <laughs>
<laughs> Have fun and get out there and keep shooting. You know, the more you take, the more you learn. That's you. awesome. Okay. I don't see any more questions now. Catherine, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, everyone, feel free to go to Catherine's website. Lots of good information and beautiful images. And see you all back here October 13th to find out how old is that Saguaro?